Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for uh, what you did for us on the cross, Lord. We thank you for the love that you have for us, Lord. We, we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you that you've given us something that we can believe in, we can trust in, something that will bless us and encourage us, Lord, something that will give us eternal life, Father. And we just thank you for that. And we pray that you would help your word to touch our hearts tonight, Father, that you would speak to each one of us, Lord. And we ask you to bless, and we ask it through your son, Jesus. Amen. So we're going to continue our study in Ephesians chapter 3, or Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And after his introduction in his letter, where he bestowed grace and peace upon the body, Paul had reminded them of the mercy and grace that God had for them, and that their salvation, their internal inheritance, was a done deal. It was sealed by the Holy Spirit. And because of Christ's work on the cross, they were redeemed, he said. They were bought for a price. They were a purchased possession. And he told them that Christ was at the right hand of the Father, God Almighty, where he had dominion over all things. And Paul's not telling them things they hadn't heard before. But it's good to be reminded. It's easy for us to forget, to not consider just who it is we're serving. And also at that time, there was a lot of false teaching going around Judaizers. They were telling people they had to do works. In order to be saved, they had to fulfill the law. But Paul told them that salvation was a gift from God, that they were saved by faith alone. They were saved by the grace of God, period. And Paul encouraged them. He said to love one another, to work together as a body, to build upon that foundation with Christ being the cornerstone that was laid down by the apostles and the prophets, which continues to apply to us today as a body. See, our ministries, our witnesses, they all need to be directed by the Holy Spirit as we build up on that foundation. And Paul reminded them that there was no division in the body. There should never be a division in the body. People were no longer considered Jews or Gentiles or slaves or free. Ephesians 2, 19, 21 says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. And we left off last week, kind of at the beginning of chapter 3, where Paul had defined his calling uh, from the Lord. He said that he wasn't just an apostle, but he was an apostle to the Gentiles. He was one who God sent to spread gospel throughout Asia, Greece, Italy, And Paul refers to the gospel, the good news, he refers to it as a mystery. Now for us, as we think of a mystery, in English, mystery is something that is unknown. It's an enigma. It's something that's impossible to understand, something that you have no explanation for. Something you'll never find out, right? For example, in science, light has the properties of a particle, and it also has the properties of a wave. It's a mystery to them. They don't understand it. But in the Greek, the word translated mystery, the word is actually in Greek, mysterion. It has a different meaning. It refers to something that has been concealed or something that has been hidden, but can be divinely revealed by God. It's actually a religious term. And we read about that mystery, that mysterion. We read about it last week at the end of the study. In fact, in verse, <clears throat> chapter 3, verse 3 and 4 said, how by, how by that revelation he made known to me the mystery as I have briefly briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So this so-called mystery or mysterion, it was revealed at the cross, Paul said. You see, everything in the Old Testament, it points to Christ. It points to him completing the plan of salvation for mankind. John 5.39 says, you search the scriptures in the Old Testament, he's talking about, you search the scriptures, for in them you think they have eternal life, and these are are they which testify of me. So you see Christ being referred to over and over again in the Old Testament. John 5, 46, Jesus said, For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. And we see that in Deuteronomy 18, 18, Moses pointing to the Messiah. He said, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I commanded. And also we see it in Micah 5, 2. Micah said, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Bethlehem was where Jesus was from. He said, Though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose songs are forth, going forth are from old, from everlasting. See, the Old Testament prophets, they understood God's plan for a Messiah. They understood that Christ was going to come down and rule on the earth. 
And they also understood the idea of, of shedding blood to atone for sin. We see that in Leviticus 17, 11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. But they had no idea of the method or the plan of salvation that God had in store for all mankind. The plan of the Messiah shedding his blood upon a cross as a sacrifice for sin was beyond their comprehension. That was the mystery. That was the mysterion. Even though they had written about God's plan of salvation, for example, you, you see that being alluded to in, in the Passover in Egypt, right? People were saved by the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. That pointed to Jesus Christ. You see it again in Isaiah 53. It's an amazing chapter. Unlike the Passover, it isn't a paradigm for the Messiah. It directly alludes to the Messiah. He said in Isaiah 53, 1, he said, Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? In other words, God here is giving them an answer to a mystery, something that hasn't been revealed. And God's saying, I'm going to tell you about this person. And he's asking them, who am I talking about? And then he says in verse 3, Isaiah 53, 3, he said, he's despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And he went on to say, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we're healed. And he goes on to say, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. He was taken from prison and from judgment, for he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. They said they made his grave with the wicked. And he died with the wicked on a cross, but at the rich with his death, he, he was buried in a rich man's tomb. So it's because he had done no violence. But it ends with, in, in verse 12, it says, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Now, we read this today, and we clearly understand that this is referring to Jesus Christ. We understand that. But we look back and we realize that this whole chapter, it isn't about a simile or a type of Christ. It's a direct prophecy about the Messiah, about Jesus Christ. And God's revealed it to us in his word, that, in that mysterion. But to the Old Testament prophets, this meaning was hidden. To Isaiah, who wrote it, it was a mystery. It was a mystery to all. They didn't understand at all what was going to happen. And last week, we read where Paul said, the mystery of salvation has been revealed to the apostles, to the prophets, to those who hear and believe in the word of God. And Paul, he's going to continue discussing his calling to share this mystery that's been revealed to him, uh, specifically to share it to the Gentiles. So let's pick it up. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8. He said, To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace I was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. Paul explains that God had ordained him to be a minister to the Gentiles, but he said, to me, who am less than the least of the saints, he said, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. But he also makes that interesting statement at the beginning. He says, to me, who am less than the least of all the saints. So Paul's saying, you know, out of all of God's saints, I'm less than the least of all of you. I'm at the bottom of the rung. You know, Bob used to talk about that one who's barely going to make into heaven. He'd be singed and smoking, you know, when they go through. Paul's saying, I'm, le I'm less than him. That sounds very strange coming from a man who'd written over half the New Testament. Someone who had suffered as much as just about as anyone because of his faith in Jesus Christ. So why would he say that he's less than the least? Well, he gives us the answer himself in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9. He says, For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle. But then he gives the reason, because I persecuted the church of God. Paul remembers where he came from, what his B.C. days, his before Christ days were like. He said in Galatians 1.13, he says, For you've heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. So Paul's saying that if anyone deserved death for his actions, he's saying, it was me. And that's why Paul mentions God's grace. This grace was given. See, Paul personally experienced both the abundant mercy and the amazing grace of God. Instead of getting the death he deserved, God used him to become the point person for spreading the gospel throughout the world. And considering Paul's actions in Judea, both before Christ and after his conversion, you can see why God sent him to Asia. 
and to Greece to spread the gospel. See, if Paul stayed in Judea and witnessed, his witness would not have been near as effective. The followers of Christ, they would have had a hard time listening to him. I mean, they considered him a murderer. I'm sure they knew saints that had been affected by the acts of his persecution. Someone that who, they thought he was someone who was worthy of death. And the Jews, they considered him to be a blasphemer. Again, in their eyes, he was someone who was worthy of death. So God sent him outside of Judea. He said that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Again, the word mysterion. Paul says that he was sent to the Gentiles to proclaim the gospel, that mystery that had been revealed to him, and also to proclaim the unsearchable riches of Christ, the blessings, the promise, the inheritance that comes with having a relationship with Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of God's plan of salvation. Paul wanted everyone to see that the body should be united as one. It should be in fellowship, part of that three-legged stool, right? With no division, we're all equal in God's eyes, and we should work together as one. In verse 10, Paul said, To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. When Jesus, speaking to his disciple concerning the mystery of the kingdom of heaven and the mystery of the gospel, Jesus told him in Matthew 13, 17, he said, For assuredly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. But it wasn't just the prophets who desired to, to, to see what they saw. The angelic beings were also watching, wondering what was going to take place. They had no idea what God's plan of salvation would look like. And 1 Peter 1.12 says, Those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, then he says, things which the angels desire to look into. See, they had no idea. The manifold wisdom, the vast wisdom of God, he said, would be made known to these angelic beings in heaven to the principalities and the powers in the heavenly places, and that he would use the church as his vehicle to reveal this great wisdom. And this was the result of Christ's death on the cross, which I'm sure it took all the angelic beings by surprise. And now with God's plan of salvation being put into place to action, these angelic beings not only heard the message of the gospel given by the apostles, but now they could see the result of God's vast wisdom through the church by the love that the church, the body of Christ, had for one another, no matter whether they were Jew or Gentile. Now, I'm sure that when Christ was nailed to the cross, there was a lot of confusion in the spiritual world. I'm sure the demonic realm thought that they had won. I mean, they probably figured, look, we're going to take Christ, we're going to have him take him, we're going to have him nail him up on a cross, and they probably figured he would come down, but he'd probably kill a lot of people in the process, and Satan's gone, you know, either way, he was going, he was going to win this battle, he thought. Christ dies up on a cross. They thought they had won. And the angels in heaven who are probably biting at the bit. Matthew 26, 53 says, or Do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? They were probably just waiting for the command from the Father to come down and administer justice, to help Christ establish his kingdom on earth. And they were waiting for God to say, Go get him. But instead, the Father turns his face away. They don't get it. But now, these principalities and powers, they begin to see the result of God's vast wisdom. What the love of Christ looks like on earth. What people reflecting Jesus Christ looks like on earth. Loving one another as Christ had loved them. Loving and blessing your enemies. What it looked like when people were filled and fled by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Paul says that this mystery, this plan of salvation, was revealed on heaven and earth. Verse 11, he said, According to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, and whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Paul says the Father's plan of salvation, his plan for eternal life, for all was accomplished by Jesus Christ our Lord. It was accomplished on the cross. And one of the outcomes of that plan was that through faith in Jesus Christ, we now have direct access to God. Ephesians 2.18 says, For through him we both have access by one spirit, to the Father. Both Jews and Gentiles alike have this access. Paul says we need to come to Christ in boldness and confidence. And Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace and help in the time of need. And this was made possible by what Christ accomplished on the cross by him shedding his precious blood for us. Hebrews 10.19 says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us 
through the veil that is his flesh. The question is, do you boldly come before the throne of God with confidence? You know, most of you, like me, you're going to say, I'm not worthy to come before, come before the throne of God. I'm not worthy. And you know what? You're right. You're not worthy. And there's nothing you can do in your own volition that will make you worthy. But the question is, do you have the faith that the blood of Christ will cleanse you from all sin? So you can come before him in confidence. If you have that faith and the boldness to come before the throne of God, then you will receive his promises. Hebrews 10, 22, 23 says, Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Come boldly to the throne. But I want to talk a little bit more about coming boldly to the throne of God. The Greek word for boldness is parisia. Boldly is metaparisia, with parisia. And parisia means, in English, boldly means to be brave, confident, or courageous. But in Greek, it means to speak freely, to be frank, to be blunt. Basically, it means freedom of speech. So to come before God isn't a physical act of courage. It's a spiritual act of honesty through prayer, through words. We're to pour out our heart, to be frank to the, and blunt to God. He knows our hearts anyway. You can pray, God, I hate that guy's guts. I just can't stand him. He's not going to go, huh. he knew it anyway. He's going to say, you should have told me that a long time ago. You see, he knows your heart. And when we give our burdens and our concerns to him, hey, here it is, Lord, you can have it all. Help me in this area. Then he can work on our lives. In fact, he will work on our lives to conform us more and more to the image of his son. It's like getting rid of a lot of baggage. It's like your sin you have to carry around in a weight. And when you ask for forgiveness of sin, that weight is gone. It's the same way. Take your prayers, give it to the Lord. Let him have it. Let him work in your life. Chapter thir Verse 13, he says, Therefore... I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. He says, therefore, in other words, because of God's plan of salvation for us, because of the work that Christ did on the cross, because we can come boldly before the throne of God, he says, therefore, I'm going to ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you. Paul's saying two things here. The first is, don't lose heart. Don't feel sorry for me. Don't mourn for me. Don't be sad because of my situation. He says, I realize I'm in chains. I realize I'm under house arrest. But the second thing he says is the reason for them losing heart, that he had tribulations for them. In other words, he's telling them, don't lose heart because I've suffered for your sakes. That's what he's telling them. Don't think it's your fault. And my first thought was, well, how did Paul suffer for the church at Ephesus? Because Paul suffered tremendously in his life. He was in danger wherever he went. He suffered sleeplessness, hunger, thirst, being cold, being naked, shipwrecked, stranded in the ocean, bit by poisonous snakes, beaten in stripes above measure, thrown in prison, stoned and left for dead. But you don't find any of these things happening to him at Ephesus, to the body he's writing this letter to. Ephesus was one, the one place where he suffered very little. In fact, the only thing in the Bible where he could possibly find him being prosecuted there, persecuted, not prosecuted, it's debatable, and I don't mean the Bible's debatable. I mean the meaning of the passage is debatable. In 1 Corinthians 15.32, Paul said, If in the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me? And because of that verse, there's some expositors who believe that Paul literally faced wild beasts in the Colosseum there. But others think that Paul is speaking theoretically. If I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, as some do, then what advantage is it to me? We don't know. But other than that, Paul had it pretty good at Ephesus. And that's why he stayed there for three years. But Paul's writing this letter to mostly Gentiles, those that he was sent by God to minister to. And the reason he was arrested in Jerusalem was because he dared to insinuate that Gentiles were children of God, just as the Jews were. See, they, they had falsely accused him of taking a Gentile past the outer court we talked about last week. They tried to kill him, but, but Paul was able to stand before them and give an account of his actions. He was able to share the gospel with them. In fact, he told the multitude at Jerusalem of his conversion, of his divine encounter with the Messiah, and he had their attention. He was given a good message. But as soon as he said that God had told him to share salvation with the Gentiles, as soon as he said there were Gentiles, it all broke loose. Acts twenty two twenty one 21 said, Then he said to me, 
He said, and the Lord said to me, Depart, for I will send you from there to the Gentiles. And they listened to him until his, this word, until he said Gentiles. And then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he's not fit to live. In other words, how dare you say that our God would love a Gentile? How dare you say that our God would show grace to a Gentile like he does the children of Abraham? That's blasphemy, they said. And if it hadn't been for the Roman garrison at Jerusalem, they probably would have torn him to pieces. But it seems to be what Paul's referring to when he tells them that he had suffered for their sake. So the reason he was in Rome was because they had him arrested. And he went to Rome because he had stood up for the Gentiles. But he not only tells them not to lose heart, he tells them that his trib- in his tribulation, that his tribulation is your glory. He tells them that they should rejoice in his tribulation for him. Now, it seems strange to us that one should rejoice or, or have glory for a brother or sister or husband or wife, son or daughter that's incarcerated. But if they're suffering because they are obedient to do what God had called them to do, Paul says it's a reason for joy. Romans 8.18 says, For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which should be revealed in us. Paul called this tribulation a light affliction, he said. And like I said, he had been through a lot. 2 Corinthians 4.17 says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Peter said, in a different way, he said, 1 Peter 4.12 and 13, he said, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. See, God has Paul right where he wants him. It's in this prison scenario that Paul's in the frame of mind to focus on the guidance of the Holy Spirit and write four prison letters. We call them books in the Bible. He wrote the letter to the Ephesians, to the Philippians, to the Colossians, to Philemon, not only to encourage the young church, which he did, but to affect the spiritual walk of millions of people in centuries to come. It was in this setting that God used Paul to do that and to touch the lives of the saints in Rome. It was in this setting that God used Paul to emulate his Lord, Jesus Christ, to be content, to be a useful tool for God to use, and to love others even when that love isn't reciprocated. Verse 14, Paul said, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Paul now begins a prayer for the church. It's interesting, according to biblical scholars during the time of Paul, when people prayed to God, usually they would stand and lift their hands up toward heaven. But here Paul says, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you might think, well, why would he do that? Well, Paul realizes who he is in the presence of. Paul may come before the throne of God boldly with the freedom of speech, but Paul has the wisdom to humble himself before God. He's in the presence of God Almighty. But does that mean you ought to kneel when you pray to God? Psalms 95, 6 says, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. In the Bible, you find Solomon praying on his knees, Ezra praying on his knees, Daniel kneeling down and praying, Peter, Stephan, and Paul all praying on their knees. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, we see Jesus doing the same. And Luke twenty two forty one says, And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed. But you know what? When you read the Bible, you have to take it all into context. You don't pick out a few verses. In the Bible, you see many times people praying that are not kneeling. There's no right or wrong posture to pray. If you feel like the Holy Spirit is telling you to kneel when you pray, then kneel when you pray. It's not a physical act that God's looking at. It's your heart that he sees. Is your heart humble before God? See, the physical act of kneeling should reflect your heart. Otherwise, your posture isn't important. But you know what is important? That you spend time praying, you spend time talking with God. But just a note on Jesus praying in the garden. He went and he prayed three times, right? Mark said on the same thing, he said 1435, well, he went a little further and he fell fell down on the ground and prayed. Matthew said he went a little further and he fell on his face and prayed. So you have to read it all in context. But Paul says, he prays to whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. See, so of all the believers in Christ, they're all named as a whole, whether in heaven or on earth, they're called the body of Christ. 
Even as individuals were named after Christ, we're called Christians, followers of Christ. And Paul says that he humbles himself in prayer before God, so in verse 16, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with the might through his spirit and the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all fullness of God. Guys, Paul's praying for the body, a body he knows very well. But you know what I noted? First thing I realized is Paul doesn't pray for health. He doesn't pray for wisdom for him or personal needs or personal wants. He doesn't pray for a new chariot for Isaiah or for, to restore Jack and Jill's marriage. His prayer is strictly for each member of the body to have a deeper relationship with their Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul begins by revealing the triune nature of God of how each entity works in the life of a believer. I have a, I have a thing here, if I can show it up. God is one. God is one, but God is also three. And you want to know what that looks like. God is one. God is the Father. God is the Son. God is the Holy Spirit. God is one. But however, the Holy Spirit is not the Son. The Son is not the Father. The Father is not the Holy Spirit. God is one. And Paul brings this out when he's talking to him here. He's speaking of the Father. He says, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. David does a great definition when he gives the riches of the glory of the Father. In 1 Chronicles 29, verse 10, it says, Therefore David blessed the Lord before all the assembly, and David said, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Next, Paul alludes to the Holy Spirit. He prays for them to be strengthened in might through his spirit in the inner man. To be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Paul prays that the inner man of each believer might be strengthened with might through the power of the Holy Spirit working within them. When Paul's talking about the inner man, I know you might be thinking, if I'm a woman, do I have an inner man? That's not what it means. But it refers to a spiritual aspect of a person. You know, our spirit that dwells within each one of us. And Paul talks about it in several of his letters. In 2 Corinthians 4.16, he says, Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. He also said in his letter to the Romans in 7.22, For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. And the only spiritual strength that we have comes from the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. In our own spirit, we don't have any power. And even though spiritually in our own strength we're weak, we can become strong through the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8 says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. John 16.13 says, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Romans 8.26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. Galatians 5.22.23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit, that's the, working in your, the Holy Spirit working in your life, will be Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All those things are the result of the Holy Spirit in your life. Also, the Holy Spirit gives you hope. In Romans 15, 13, it says that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And in 1 Corinthians 12, 11, it says the Holy Spirit bestows gifts upon you, upon each one of us. It says, but one and the same Spirit works all these things. He's speaking of spiritual gifts, distributing to each one individually as he wills. See, by the work of the Holy Spirit, within our lives, we can be spiritually strengthened with might. And then Paul brings in the next entity of the triune God, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. See, God is love. And Christ demonstrated his love for us by shedding his blood on a cross for us to remove our sins so that we could have eternal life. Christ's love for us is unfathomable. We can't grasp having a love that's so wide that you can't get around it. 
We can't grasp a love that's so long that no matter how far you get away from God, you can't get away from his love. A love that no matter how low you go in your life, he's still there. And a love that reaches into heaven, and if you will let him, it'll take you into the throne room of God. Paul prays that we'd be able to comprehend the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge. He says that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. Guys, that's a great prayer. When I pray for you guys, my first prayer, and I, I, if you have prayer requests, I pray for them. My first prayer is that you develop a closer walk with God. But then God, uh, Paul closes his prayer with, he says in verse 20, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations. He's talking about us there. He says, forever and ever. Amen. That's a wonderful prayer. I pray that for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are a wonderful, mighty God, Lord. Uh, Lord, we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for the indwelling of your Holy Spirit, Lord. We thank you of the love that you have for us, Lord, and we pray that we'd be able to reflect you to others, Lord, that when people see us, somehow they would get a glimpse of you, Lord. We pray you just bless us, Lord, strengthen us, Lord. Uh, you know our needs, you know our wants, you know our desires, Lord. We pray we give it to you, Father, and let you just do that work that you choose to do in us. We ask it through your Son, Jesus. Amen.